My name is Rubin Zeman. I am a EASC fellow scholar here. Uh, of course, I know for the first time I was many times here before. It's very my big pleasure uh, to be the moderator of this, uh, um, for me, very important panel uh, because um, we will talking about a very important issue. That's uh, the issue of the EU integration. Uh, as you know, the topic is integration in the Eastern Europe and Western Balkan. Is there a chance for the new East-West dialogue? Uh, here with me are very distinguished panelists. I will introduce them later. Uh, but however, I think it's not necessary to, to make one introduction of the topic because it's all of us we are very familiar with the topic, all of us we are very aware about um, all the um, phenomena, processes, consequences regarding the EU integration process. Um, I should just make a little introduction because I'm here in uh, in, um, in EAS uh, these uh, four months because uh, we are conducting one research and the survey is still going on until the end of this week. Uh, so I will just present exclusively for you now some of the preliminary result of the of the of the survey uh, that we are um, conducting uh, in our in the Balkans and in the Central European countries. Uh, it's not a big number, but it's very how to say uh, high quality person of it that we uh, make the question that we decide this commissary that the mainly almost 70 percent of the people that uh, fulfill the questionnaire are phd phd candidates master and master candidates so um, it's very high level the number is around 80 uh, persons until now but uh, i think it's uh, very valuable uh, we will see maybe it's not uh, very useful, but also I will not show this. We will see with Ferenc next week how we will also give recommendation to the Hungarian government because the Hungaria from the 1st of July will be the chair of the European Union. And uh, also we had some questions there, what will be the uh, the priorities that uh, maybe Hungarian presidency can hold. Okay, just a little bit introduction. You know that uh, actually from the Thessaloniki su summit 2003 was made the decision that uh, the, the Balkans have to be integrated in the European Union. Unfortunately, uh, almost uh, 20, 21 <laughs> years uh, gone, but until now we don't have the, the, the full integration of the, of the, of the, of the Western Balkan. Uh, oh, what is happening now? How is going this? Okay. okay, just uh, to remind of the uh, last uh, meeting of the <coughs> European Council of the U U European Union, uh, in the EU large and packet for 2023, you know that uh, uh, Ukraine and Moldova, <laughs> the, they actually they, they are starting the, the process of EU integration now. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina also uh, get the, the green light for um, for the negotiation, but uh, fortunately, we all of us know very well what's going on in Bosnia and uh, how, how how hard is the issue in Bosnia. Montenegro, um, I think, is the most closest uh, country to the for the next. Uh, Enlargement already has been uh, to the, the member of the of the European Union. Serbia and Kosovo, you know very well what's going on. Uh, I think that these days will he again will be one meeting in Brussels regarding the, um, the implementation of the Ohrid Agreement, eh? <laughs> the, the second <laughs> second Ohrid Agreement. Uh, North Macedonia actually the negotiation is stopped because uh, from. From Monday, we have a new government there, uh, led by the Vomero Dopamane and the West right wing party, actually. And uh, they are, uh, 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 up to now, we don't have any signal that the 
constitutional changes will be implemented this year. Maybe we hope that it will be somewhere in October, but we will see. And of course, we know that Albania is also very well prepared to be the member of the European Union, but uh, they have one small problem. Elida probably will, will say much more regarding the, the weight of the Greece that we have. Uh, and, uh, it's a temporary. Okay, so j just uh, a little brief as an introduction and contribution to the, to the discussion, maybe. Some of the, of the um, uh, preliminary results. Uh, that do you think that the countries of Western Balkans should be the part of the European Union in, in our survey? So almost 75% you see they are agree, 9% uh, disagree, and 70% are neutral. So again, I will say that these are the, uh, the, the people from the Western Balkans and the Central European. We have some also uh, from Germany, from Austria, from Italy, but very small number. And uh, this is a very interesting question. We had this discussion before yesterday about the European political community. Uh, so even that we in the Western Balkan, we are generally uh, against to be actually <laughs> the part of this uh, European political community, but we want to be the member, the full member of the European Union. The results are showing that uh, almost 19% uh, are strongly agree, 27% are neutral, and um, uh, 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 I can see uh, 30 are, are not agree and 18 are disagree. So it's very, for me, it's very surprising what we got uh, as a result of this question. And do you think that all the Western Balkan countries who enter to the EU together in a big package? Also, you see that um, strongly, almost we have the, um, let's say, one kind of balance between strongly agree, neutral, and, and agree. And, um, oh, again, here. Do you think that the, for the membership of the country of the Western Balkans, the fulfillment of Copenhagen criteria and condition negotiation framework should be viewed very strictly by the European Commission? Also, you see that um, strongly agree only 10% of the people, so they, they wanted much more liberal conditions for entering the EU for the Western Balkans. Uh, 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 agree are uh, 29, neutral are 29 also, so only 20 are disagree and strongly disagree 10%. Okay, these are the actually the issues uh, that we put. Uh, uh, the percentage maybe are not so uh, exactly because here the people uh, had the right to choose more than one answer. So one, two, three, four, five maybe. But generally as a topic we see that anti-corruption, organized crime is the, the, the most important issue that concerning all the people. So it's almost 50 percent of the of the people said that anti-corruption. Free competition is in the same uh, position, rule of law, democratization, and th these are the four, let's say, priority topics and that the, the other are much more less, let's say, interesting and uh, what derogation should be extracted from the EU regarding the session of the Western Balkan. We say also the same situation, anti-corruption, special condition for these countries, especially for Macedonia and Kosovo. Okay, I will cut because uh, Ivana is me, but this is the last. <laughs> Uh, it was just a little bit the introduction of the topic, and uh, now uh, the rules, because we are six panelists. Uh, we have two hours. I will, uh, uh, I will ask you to, 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 to be very brief, uh, no, up to 15 minutes each of other. I will remind you two minutes before the 15, gone to, to summarize, because we have to let also the, the time for the people who are here and the people who are online to, to also discuss and to, to give some questions. So my pleasure is um, to, uh, to introduce my other panelists. It's uh, Martin Ogrusdi, Secretary of the Strategic Advisory Board of the Prime Minister of, probably of Hungary. He is not written. <laughs> <laughs> Ivana. Uh, then Vedran Djihic from OIP, Austria. Christina Gressler from Budapest, Andras University, Budapest, Hungary. Elira Luri from uh, T 
Tirana, Luar, Luaras University. Also, she is one of the ISCA. Yes. A neighbor here in my house, a neighbor in, uh, in Balkans there. Uh, another neighbor is uh, Vigan Choroli, Deputy Minister of Justice of the Republic of Kosovo, not Kosovo. <laughs> and uh, Kaleb Vok also he is coming from Kosovo, but he's not uh, Kosovar, he's from uh, o Austria, France? United, United States. States. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you see. But we discussed yesterday a little time and I thought that he is from Austria. <laughs> and um, I, I will I will not waste the time now to introduce. You can read all the biography of all of them in this uh, uh, booklet. So um, my pleasure is to invite uh, Martin Ugrasdi to take a floor. Thank you very much and good morning. I'm usually not going first, but I'll try to uh, be concise and uh, give you a very broad picture of how we look at the Western Balkans and EU enlargement. As you know, we're going to take over the rotating presidency of the European Council next week, and uh, enlargement will be one of the priorities. Now, we see a few obstacles connected to that. First of all is the um, institutional part of it, that who's going to be heading what, and uh, we've been hearing that Yesterday, there was a compromise reached on the leading positions in the European Commission, but uh, that was the negotiators and then the heads of state of government. So let's see if this is already over, uh, but um, the institutional setup is still in the making. Um, having said that, Hungary has always been in favor of EU enlargement, partly because we also came late to this party. So from the moral point of view, we cannot have any other position than to be for enlargement, because if we were let in, we have to work for the others that they would let in to the EU as well. And that remains unchanged, despite the fact that we do see some structural problems within the European Union, part of which was addressed during the European parliamentary elections a couple of weeks ago. And uh, a more significant part of that, which is yet to be tackled uh, on the European level, and this is what we're working on, as part of the presidency, but also as our larger participation in the European Union uh, in general. But if you look at the enlargement, that remains a strategic priority for Hungary because of at least two reasons. The first is, first is uh, traditional national security issues, that we have to ensure that peace is there in our neighborhood and also further beyond. And we tend to joke that the issue with the Western Balkans EU membership is that they are already within the European Union because the EU surrounds all the six countries. So whatever happens in the region will have significant impact on uh, all the European states, regardless whether they like this or not. And also if you look at how people move between uh, the Western Balkans countries and EU member states, you see that you, there are many, many connections. and. Uh, if I allude to the, the uh, demographic problems of the six countries, the EU is also part of the problem that it's been attracting so many young and working age people from these countries to the EU that uh, serious structural problems started to emerge in all the six countries. Um, but going back to the presidency, so we will keep talking about enlargement. We will try to get as many countries as close as possible and as far as possible throughout the negotiating process. Um, and we do not really think about the European political community as an alternative to full membership in the long run. So uh, the original idea that this might be something of a waiting room where all the countries will sit eternally is not something that we can uh, support in the long run. However, we're going to pay attention to this because this can be a very important intermediary step for all the countries who wish to join the EU one day to get closer to the integration in the long run. Therefore, we are going to organize the EPC summit later this year. Um, but focus will remain on enlargement. With uh, Commissioner Varhei going out, and uh, I think nobody has any expectations that he's going to continue in his current position, um, I think we also have to look at what the individual countries achieved in the last five years. And uh, if I remember Edi Rama and his uh, speech in Blad last year, when he asked that whom these countries should attack to get involved in the European Union, uh, I think there is a very strong case that that kind of merit-based and uh, predictable approach that the EU had for the aspiring countries, uh, which actually kept them waiting for more than 20 years after Thessaloniki, uh, is being challenged because of political and geopolitical reasons. And uh, here we think the credibility of the EU is at stake. And uh, the credibility of the EU is at stake because if uh, we go back to the Orwellian phrase that all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others, meaning that some countries based on certain interests can have shortcuts in the accession process, that is something which at the end will undermine 
the equality of all the countries which are about to join the European Union, which are in the middle of the negotiating process. And obviously the elephant in the room is Ukraine, but we see certain political willingness to uh, speed up the accession process of Moldova, despite the fact that the European Commission is not really holding them accountable for all those changes which are required from the Western Balkans countries. So our approach is very simple. Uh, all countries should be treated fairly and equally. That means that uh, even those who are enjoying the uh, sped up process these days will have to comply with all the regulations, but we see that this is not the case. So if we remember the European Council meeting last December, when the European Commission made a proposal that even though Ukraine doesn't fulfill four out of the seven criteria which is required to start the negotiating process, this is not important and we should move ahead because this is the geopolitical necessity. So if you take this point to the extreme, I think it's, we can claim it fairly that it was the European Commission violating the European principles of rule of law because it was disregarding its own rules and regulations. The guardian of the treaties, if you will, have been disregarding the treaties for political reasons. And I think in the long run this is the most critical element of the enlargement process right now because we have many, many instances where European organizations and European institutions are violating their own rules. Uh, and in the meantime, we see that they hold many other countries accountable for those very rules that they are violating. Internally, as well, as you see it in the case of Hungary and you've seen it in the case of Poland, um, at least before this government came to power, which is a different story, but I think equally interesting. And uh, you see this with the Western Balkans countries as well. And um, if I, I think it was really interesting to look, to look at the opinion polls, but the problem there is that uh, it or it's not a problem, obviously, because it's looking at a different dimension. But if you look at the opinion polls from the Western Balkans countries, you will see that support for EU membership has been declining. Because EU membership as such has been a very elusive target, and it's always been changing. So I understand that it's a very frustrating experience that you negotiate, you do all the changes, you change the, change the name of the country, you change the constitution, just to find out that the European Commission comes back to you saying that, thank you very much, but this is not enough, and these are the new conditions. And if you do this over and over again, then obviously you're going to lose the enthusiasm uh, of the aspiring countries to join the EU one day, not to mention the overall structural problems of the integration that we are seeing uh, on the European level as well. And I would really not like to go to that right now. Um, so this is about the credibility part. Uh, but still, um, and going back to the uh, presidency and the Hungarian strategic interest in the region, I think it's important that uh, first we make sure that uh, the events of the 1990s will not be repeated. Therefore, we have to ensure that peace is there in the Western Balkans, and this is why we have deployed our military to both Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo for the last uh, many years, uh, which are, by the way, th our biggest missions abroad uh, when it comes to the Hungarian Defense Forces. This is why we are trying to provide economic assistance, and uh, this is why we are pursuing uh, the Euro the Euro-Atlantic Atlantic where it's applicable integration of the region in general. Um, but, of course, we have economic stakes as well. If you look at Hungary and if you look at the economies of the region, you will see that uh, this is an area where Hungarian companies do have an advantage. Uh, they are relatively larger than the companies of the region. Uh, they have more capital. They might have know-how as well, even though not on all occasions. And therefore, they can make inroads and uh, can, can do business in a way that benefits these companies themselves, but also the countries where they have been operating. And of course, in services like banking and telecom, um, this is easier. In some other sectors where you have to do manufacturing and mining and, and all those other things, it's a bit more complicated, you have a longer time frame. But the point is that because of the physical proximity of the region, this is the area where the Hungarian, growing Hungarian multinational companies can you know, go to the training room, if you will, to see that how does it work to invest abroad, how does it work to operate in a different legal environment, how, does it, how, how you can make a company work in a different language with different cultural traditions, and so on and so forth. And if they're going to be successful, and still these are relatively small markets, if we are very honest to ourselves, then they might be able to expand further, also possibly globally. So these are the training grounds if you will, of the Hungarian, bigger Hungarian companies. 
And uh, this is why the economic integration of the Western Balkans is important for us. And um, we still believe that if you can uh, dismantle the obstacles between the countries, if you can make people, everyday people, uh, get more closer together, do business together, go to school together, that can also diffuse the historical conflicts which do exist in the region. And uh, we also have some experience with that if you look at the Hungary-Serbia and the Hungary-Slovakia relationship, we were able to cover a very long way in the last 20 years, and a significant part of that, what we were not separated anymore, especially uh, in our relationship with Slovakia, physically through the borders. And this is why, for example, we have been pushing for the um, inclusion of Romania into the Schengen zone. This is why we're looking at all the opportunities, how we can make the border crossing process easier between Hungary and Serbia, and, but also within the Western Balkans. So in that sense, uh, getting people and goods and capital and services moving is one of our main priorities. And obviously the easiest way to do that is if these countries would get into the EU one day. And uh, maybe the final thoughts that I would like to finish my intervention on would be that how we can restore the credibility of enlargement, not only on the Western Balkans, but also in the former Eastern Partnership countries. Because if we take the geopolitical track, then I do not see any credible claims that why, for example, uh, Kosovo and Albania and Serbia and, and anybody else in the region shouldn't be included in the next enlargement round, whether, whether, whenever that will happen. But if we go into the merit-based approach, if we follow our rule of law that was established in Copenhagen and even before that, then we would like to see some consistency when it comes to the, uh, to the accession process of Moldova and Ukraine. Not because we don't support these countries, not because we don't want them in the European Union, but because if we start to violate our own rules, then those rules will become useless at the end of the day. And um, the very final thought would be that, you know, this might come strange as, uh, from, from a uh, representative of the Hungarian government that Hungary is calling for the rule of law to be observed in the European Union. Because if you look at our history with the European Union, you see that we had many, many debates over the last more, oh, more than 20 years uh, when it comes to the rule of law, but we always followed the procedure. So when we disagreed, we started corresponding with the European Commission. If we disagreed further, we went to the European Court of Justice, and then the European Court of Justice made a ruling, and of course we kept battling there as long as we could, but if there was a ruling at the end, of course we accepted that. Maybe uh, we'll see if this disregard for rule of law, which we see in the side of the European Commission, will. Uh, come to us as well when it comes to uh, the recent ruling of the ECJ on the mandatory uh, reloc relocation quotas, which was passed two or three weeks ago. But so far, we've been following the rules, despite the fact that many other actors have not been following those very rules that have been established. And I guess I'll just stop here. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, so you, you had more two minutes, but thank you. <laughs> um, Mr. Vedran Djikic from uh, OIIP Austria. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning in wonderful Kursk. Now I'm for the first time here and I like it. I need to, 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 keep, uh, to keep repeating coming here. Uh, uh, Thanks for the title of the whole summer school, uh, Ferenc and, and the colleagues, Europe and the Minotaur, Geopolitics Between Myths and Reality. And let me uh, start by picking up on the title. Uh, I would just like to replace geopolitics with enlargement uh, and, and put it as enlargement between myths and uh, reality. Uh, and uh, when you speak about uh, myths and reality, uh, the first things that comes into my mind is the Hollywood movies. Uh, and uh, as I, unfortunately, uh, I'm not that young anymore, uh, and I was, uh, when Thessaloniki happened, uh, already working on the EU enlargement, it was 20 years ago, I was a bit younger, uh, but we are still young, I mean, 40s are the new 30s, <laughs> as they say. Uh, uh, I sometimes uh, I attended a lot of conferences on, on, on the EU enlargement uh, and I have to admit, and it might be that some colleagues of mine in the round might have the same feeling, uh, I have to admit that a certain tiredness 
uh, uh, and 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 a kind of uh, being almost on a on a on a on a mer on a verge of uh, intellectual breakdown uh, uh, has occurred in the last 20 years when it comes to the enlargement of the Western Balkans and that'll come to Ukraine and Moldova too. But anyway, my my feeling as speaking about Hollywood movies. Uh, the first movie uh, that comes into my mind is the Groundhog Day. Uh, so basically, you you just wake up uh, and and everything starts again uh, from the scratch. Meaning Copenhagen, rule of law, institutional reforms. You go on and you go on, and then you go go to sleep, take a pill if you wish to sleep a bit deeper. I mean, you will need to t take 20 pills to, to see the EU changing in the meantime. But anyway, you wake up and then it's again EU enlargement, rule of law, institutions and everything. And there's another another movie uh, which is never ending story uh, that, that also goes like in. Uh, and, and I think uh, uh, the movies uh, are f fun, uh, but they, there is a certain reality uh, uh, into it. Uh, and my first question would be actually uh, now in 2024, uh, is the enlargement still real uh, or is it a myth? Uh, or should we start thinking about a possible situation, uh, a Groundhog Day point 2.0, where you wake up and the situation is not the same, but it's worse than it was uh, before you uh, 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 went to bed. Uh, I think when it comes to the Western Balkans and to at least some countries of the Western Balkans, the situation is worse uh, than it was 10 or 15 years ago. And I think we have to face this reality. And I think when it comes to the EU enlargement in general, despite all the geopolitical necessity right now and the rhetorics of the European Commission, I think at least when it comes to the Western Balkans, after more than 24 years of the EU integration or non-integration or disintegration, whatever you wish, uh, I think it's uh, it's okay to ask the question if the enlargement is is it is it more realistic that the enlargement will happen or is it more realistic that the enlargement will never happen? And I think it will be 50-50. I don't know. I mean, you know, and and a colleague of mine did uh, a kind of a. Uh, to speak in real terms, I kind of looked into the reforms or the tempo of, of reforms uh, in the countries of the Western Balkans between uh, 2019 and 2021. Uh, and he came uh, with results uh, that uh, if the same pace is kept, uh, my home country, and I'm originally from Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, will join the European Union in 2093, which is in 70 years from now on. Will be a great moment, but there will be probably no one uh, uh, still living in Bosnia, just a safari land to visit, to see the rivers and the mountains. Uh, anyway, I, I just wanted to say and underline, this is my first point, we have to ask tough questions. Uh, and, and I also want to underline that the time, the time does play a role. Uh, uh, time is important. Uh, timing is important, but also time. The time that passes is, is, is important. And uh, we can't uh, wait for 24 more years uh, uh, to wake up again and speak about rule of law and institutions. The second uh, uh, point, uh, now I know I need to, to get more serious, uh, is the is the is the question that basically uh, now with the geopolitical big geopolitical turn uh, and with the Russian aggression against Ukraine in 2022, of course the game uh, has changed. Uh, uh, the game has changed, and now with uh, uh, Ukrainians and Moldovans, but also Georgians showing passion. Uh, not only for the EU enlargement as a technical process for the economic development or whatever, but for the values uh, of the European Union. And I think we need to remind ourselves that the EU is not just about economic trade. Uh, it is about economic trade, it's about connections, it is about uh, common market, but it is fundamentally about common values. There is no European Union which is not democratic and liberal. Uh, and that goes to the to the address of, of many member states of the European right now, uh, and also to the country that I come from, Austria, which is now heading into the elections in on 29th of September, and the far right, which is uh, which is everything, but not for Brussels, not for the European Union, and, and not for the liberal uh, open society democracy vision of, of, of Europe uh, is heading the polls and has good chances to to win the elections. So. 
I think uh, a lot has changed, uh, and what we see today is actually that uh, uh, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, and to a certain part Georgia, but now in technical terms, Ukraine uh, and Moldova uh, are marching forward while the Western Balkans are lagging behind. So the game has totally changed. The engine is Ukraine. Uh, out of the geopolitical necessity, and the Western Balkans uh, is, to use a metaphor, if you have a speedy train, and then the the, the, the first the, the, the first part of the, the engine of the train is just, you know, speeding like the French TGV, or, uh, and then you have this kind of a small and very slow trains that are connecting Budapest and Belgrade still, waiting for the Chinese to <laughs> finish, finish the, the rail connection, and then you just lose the wagons uh, 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 on, on the way. And now uh, I think there is an imminent danger that this will be uh, a process that will be run by Ukraine, and there is an imminent danger that the uh, Western Balkans get stuck uh, uh, while Ukraine and Moldova are marching forward. So this is my second point. The third point, what are the key challenges? Uh, uh, and I think th key challenges overall for the EU enlargement, EU integration, but to a certain extent also to, uh, uh, to uh, European Union. And I would just divide them into three sections. The first section is actually that uh, in some parts, at least of the Western Balkans, we see uh, uh, revisionist, uh, nationalist, uh, retrotopian, uh, type of politics on the scene. But what, what does it mean? It means basically that uh, certain countries and certain politicians and political political parties are basically trying to portray uh, uh, a vision of the future based on the remnants of the past uh, or of the past that never existed actually. So basically this is this kind of a promise, we strong Serbs, Bosniaks, Albanians, whatever, uh, pride, I mean all these kind of uh, values and elements that might be important for the for, for, for the nation, but that uh, are contradicting uh, the 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 essence of the European enlargement. And when we, I mean, just looking back and mentioning at least few few moments, I mean, when we uh, just look back at uh, at recent events between Bosnia and Serbia, at this genocide resolution of uh, regarding Srebrenica that was uh, accepted in the General Assembly and the way how Serbia and also Bosnia and part of Republic of Serbska mobilized against this vision, etc., etc. When we look at the rhetorics, I mean, today at the front page of the w one of the most important Serbian uh, dailies, uh, after Serbia lost the soccer game yesterday, I mean, they didn't lose, but they, they didn't qualify for the quarter, for the, uh, they are out, but the headline, uh, on the on the on the front page of this news uh, news uh, outlet was basically that the ship tars, which is a, 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 a kind of a, a, a bad 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 name and, and a symbol for the Albanians and the Ustashas, the Croatian fascists, are out. Uh, not the single mentioning that Serbia has played a game or nothing. So basically, you see a kind of a reproduction of, of, of something that reminds me of, of the 19th century, actually. And this is, this is uh, in parts of the region, spreading. I mean, uh, I mean, I see colleagues from Northern Mas North Macedonia, and then we'll probably also speak about North Macedonia later on in the Q&A, but uh, I, I see some processes of going back was in North Macedonia, uh, and, and that's, that's quite dangerous. That's, that's the first part of this basket. The second part of the, part of the basket uh, is something that I describe as reformism or formalism without substance. So, uh, uh, in the course of the EU enlargement, uh, we have seen, uh, at least in the Western Balkans, a lot of reforms and formal reforms introduced, but with no proper implementation, no proper follow-up. So basically, you hollowed the whole concept of rule of law and reforms by accepting something that is presented as a reform, but it has no kind of a real underpinning. Uh, and I think this is a this, this is something that has developed a kind of a speed on itself uh, in, the, in, in, in the Western Balkans and that creates a huge gap between the expectations of the EU and, 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 and the countries on the ground. And this uh, might become a danger in Ukraine and Moldova too. So it's, it, I think it would be utterly important to follow up and to see basically that reforms and formalism or uh, reformism, pretending to reform and formalism are not 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 leading us towards the EU integration and towards the, the the possible future. And the third part of this basket uh, that that uh, I need to address is the issue of security. 
uh, I think you see how quickly the situation can change from countries that are integrating and moving towards the European Union, democratizing, like the Western Balkans were doing in the 2000s, into a situation uh, where you have a security crisis. Uh, I mean, what happened last year on 24th of September between Kosovo and Serbia uh, brought the region almost on the brink of a conflict. What happens almost on a daily basis in Bosnia and Herzegovina with threatening secession uh, by Milor Dodik uh, is equally dangerous. Dangerous, and I'm uh, responding and, and just referring to what you said in your first intervention. I think if Hungary. Uh, uh, would be utterly serious about the enlargement with, with, with the value underpinning uh, the, the course of action should not be to strengthen the K4 troops, but to address Dodik, uh, which is actually having a, a close relationship to, to some parts of the Hungarian leadership. I think we need to call a spade a spade if we want to uh, actually progress with, uh, with the EU enlargement. So security issues are some, sometimes uh, homegrown, actually, because of the EU's attitude and the attitude of some member states. So basically, uh, I think we need to speak about this one. So uh, I have two and a half more minutes, huh? <laughs> two and a half, yeah, I'm calculating quite good. Uh, so uh, just to make last two points, uh, the I, I just recently attended a conference in Bratislava on the EU enlargement that, that that, that was, I and mean it's, it's quite important that we have a new debate and that we have colleagues from Moldova and Ukraine joining and, and, and bringing uh, questions but also demanding something. And I, there was a colleague from Ukraine, her, her name is Marina uh, Yaroshevich, I think she's somewhere close to the government or pushing for the EU enlargement uh, uh, in Ukraine itself. And then uh, I'm just, I just want to quote her with Two, two sentences that I think are quite important for our thinking about enlargement today. So uh, the first sentence is that the EU is trying to say yes and no at the same time. Uh, uh, so yes, enlargement, priority, but no, actually not really. So we, I mean, that was the case in the Western Balkans. And, and, and what she, she said, the Ukrainian population, Ukraine is not going to be ready to accept this yes and no at the same time. So that points at some key challenges and some decisions that need to be taken. And the second quote is, she said, either we are in or we are out. So she's, I mean, she just offensively said, either we play it right uh, and, and we do not pretend and we push forward uh, for, for it because we have a momentum, and if the EU doesn't want, then we are out. And that brings me to, to some of the challenges at, at the European level. I think when we speak about enlargement, we can't uh, neglect the EU internal dynamics uh, and, and debates and reforms. I mean, now uh, we got the new parliament. I mean, uh, uh, there is a bit of, of a stronger far right, but we still don't know how this is going to play out. Uh, but I think uh, there are certain, certain questions. The first question is leadership. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the Hungarian uh, Commission for Enlargement, when it comes to the rule of law, was not uh, the best tool that Hungary uh, could have added to the EU enlargement uh, from my point of view. So there was a lot of criticism. I think leadership matters that needs to be uh, a per person, man or a woman, that really stands also behind the values and had uh, and has a weight within the European Union. I think this is, this is going to be important. And then when it comes to the procedures within the European Union, I think the majority voting issue and qualified majority voting issue needs to be put on the table. Uh, otherwise, uh, there will be no membership for the Western Balkans, but unfortunately not for, for Moldavia and, and for Ukraine either. Uh, I mean, as long as you have Croatia and Serbia in the state of the relation that they are right now, no way for Serbia to progress. And the same goes for Macedonia, Bulgaria, not to repeat all the whole stories, etc., etc. I think uh, this is now uh, 2024, 2025 will be a decisive time. Uh, this is where we will get the answer. Where we, whether we go to the Groundhog Day uh, back or we go for some kind of uh, at least promising romantic uh, comedy or, or something serious that leads us to the, to the goal. And my last, last, uh, last sentence uh, is, uh, uh, actually brings me back to the, to the normative horizons and, 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 and to something that the EU enlargement from the very beginning on always was and has been. And this is basically offering a promise for a more promising and better future than it is right now. And I think uh, uh, 
what, what some of the citizens of Georgia and Moldova and what Ukrainians put at display, but what Western Balkanese people unfortunately don't put at display, uh, is a certain kind of enthusiasm and believe that there is a normative horizon of the European Union that offers not only economic trades, but also uh, certain values. Values of a better life based on rule of law, on human rights, on universalism, etc., etc. And I think uh, this has been missing a lot within the European Union right now, and this has been endangering the whole European project, if you wish, uh, as EU27. So basically, I think we need to put more efforts into it. Call the spade a spade. Uh, don't engage in, in double talk and double, 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 double rhetorics, uh, and basically try to fight or fight for something that we believe uh, uh, is valuable for the future of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, actually, you take those three minutes from <laughs> from Martin. Okay. Um, now I give in the microphone the floor to um, Christina Grisler from Andrasi Andrasi Andras University in Budapest. Yes. Uh, thanks very much. Um, yeah, thanks uh, the organizers for inviting me to be here. It's actually the second time in Kusak, so <laughs> I met some people here already uh, years ago, so it's good to be back. Yeah, it's very difficult now to add on what already was uh, mentioned, so it's kind of um, because I, I prepared kind of an introduction in, in what's going on with the EU enlargement. So I, will m I might repeat uh, some things which have been already said, but... Um, uh, Stick with me and we hope I can add something to the discussion as well. Um, there are three aspects I really want to address today. I mean, it was kind of um, mentioned already, but I really want to figure out uh, what's going on with this new momentum. So there were, in 2022 and, you know, in the last uh, month and years, there was the discussion there's a new momentum in the... EU enlargement process. But is it really happening for the Western Balkan countries? So that's kind of the question. Of course, we have now an upgrade of uh, Bosnia f um, to a, a, a candidate country. We have li a visa liberalization for Kosovo, but that was already prepared for a while. Um, and now what I can see is happening is kind of the focus on Montenegro. So there is a push. I mean, the European Union realizes the need now a success case to keep the other Western Balkan countries on track. So there is very much a focus on Montenegro and um, the dangers I always see if there is a focus on, on the EU, that the EU is pushing for reforms and that's kind of the difficulty we have. You push for reforms which normally require in a democratic process, they require some time. So actually the EU is kind of undermining the democratic processes in the countries because they want to see results and the results can be hollow because they are not, you know, they're, they're the stakeholders are not, um, be, have not been involved, lobbying groups, NGOs haven't been uh, involved in the decision-making process, NGOs, civil societies, something the EU requires as well, they're kind of ex excluded. So this is kind of hollowing out the academic um, the academic, sorry, <laughs> the democratic process of, you know, reaching to um, uh, decisions and reaching, you know, it's just about creating an output. And I think this is kind of uh, um, a bit um, problematic. So, um, but I think, you know, we might see actually Montenegro being the next uh, EU member state, but because it's not really hurting. I mean, it's kind of population-wise, uh, it's kind of, um, um, you know, it's just, it's not going to hurt the European Union. In that regard, they have already the euro. I mean, the only issue with the debt, you know, that was kind of settled, um, but um, it, that, that's kind of um, an issue. Um, I think um, an idea for, for, you know, as a success as a story. We have now... Yeah, uh, comes later, sorry. I don't have any... So you have to listen to me, and then I only have some graphs <laughs> to really make uh, the point stronger. Thanks very much. Then, of course, now we have the start of negotiation talks with uh, uh, Moldova and Ukraine, which is a you know, extremely fast process. I mean, uh, Montenegro, how long they had to struggle to get, uh, not Montenegro and uh, North Macedonia, how long they had to wait, Albania as well, to be, you know, they had to jump several hoops and loops to get there. 
So, and of course, then the question arises with credibility of the entire process of the European Union. And I think this is something we might should discuss as well. Wha what kind of process do we want? Do we want still this merit-based process, which the EU claims they're sticking with, but question mark from my side, or are we going more down a political approach? I mean, something the Hungarian government is in favor of saying, you know, to be honest, it was always a political process. It was always political decisions which uh, made the enlargement um, happen. So should we just not be honest about it and, you know, name it as it is? So that's um, uh, maybe something to, to think about it. Um, and now, you know, the... We talked about the Hungarian presidenc uh, presidency, so I think this is will come up uh, more often today, and the, the priority of the Western Balkans. I mean, for me, in the case of Hungary, it's always the problem that, I mean, it's, you know, the countries in the Western Balkans need um, supports, they need countries supporting them um, in the way for EU integration. And of course, it's uh, logically, it's kind of the neighboring countries because there is the interest is kind of there. It's just, it's always, be difficult to push for EU enlargement on wrong reasons, and we have to be careful. You know what? What? What do we wish for? So, I mean, if Serbia is uh, not ready to be admitted as a, a member state, then it shouldn't be admitted, and you know it shouldn't be uh, pushed. Uh, because again, if reforms are required, reforms need time, and reforms need to be um, considered in that regard. Okay, so the second point I wanted to bring up, so the first one was more, you know, let's talk about the new momentum. Is there a new momentum? I mean, do the countries in the region actually feel there is something happening? And the second one is, you know, when we're talking about geopolitics, and it was uh, mentioned this morning as well, if you look at the countries of the Western Balkans, they're kind of in the middle of the European Union. So it would actually make sense to admit the countries because of the location, you know, we have transport routes going to the, through the area. I mean, um, anyone traveling between Hungary and Serbia in summer months try to avoid the, uh, the motorway because you're stuck on the Hungarian-Serbian border for hours. So that's, um, that's uh, a, an issue that, that, that's problematic. It's even ha um, damaging business, transport, um, uh, economic ties uh, between the region. Um, and then we have, it was mentioned as well, we have people living in both areas within the European Union and being from the Western Balkan countries. So we have the issue of brain drain. So actually people live already in the European Union. So it, that's uh, uh, another um, aspect. The Western Balkan countries as well are a member of the energy community. They are participating in European projects. So there's a lot of happening. There's a lot of interdependence. There's the focus of the regional markets. It's kind of smaller markets, of course, but they are kind of um, uh, looking towards uh, the European Union. I mean, there are attempts of this Open Balkan Initiative. There is a, a attempts of this regional market. We have SEFTA, SEFTA being blocked at the moment and kind of not really working the way it should be working. So regional cooperation on economic terms in the region is difficult because, uh, especially Montenegro is saying, you know, why should we start working on co uh, um, co regional cooperation in the area where we have to put in agreements, um, um, administrative structures and everything, if we actually should be preparing for EU accession. So, and the administrative uh, um, systems in the countries are relatively, relatively small. So for them even, you know, they have then to do two parallel uh, processes at the same time, which doesn't make any sense. So it's kind of already the idea is going for the, the European market. And then as well, um, population-wise, we have 17.5 7 million uh, people living in the, in the Western Balkans, around, or 18 million something, <laughs> the last figures I looked up. So, and compared to uh, 450 million in the European Union. So it would be a rather small you know, percentage of population joining the European Union at once. So, okay, we could say from geopolitical side and geopolitical narrative, it would make absolutely sense to include the countries. But now the but, but comes. Okay, uh, maybe I go back. Uh, so here we have the, the, the figures which I, I looked after. 
But the other issue is, of course, political development. And that's kind of problematic after 20 years. I mean, we always talk about the accession process takes 10, 20 years. The European Union as well is support, you know, put money into the region, uh, made agreements with the region. And still now we have kind of a democratic backsliding. We have democratic backsliding as well within the EU. We know that. That's not, I mean, well, we have elections in Austria. We're really looking forward to that one. But I mean, uh, there are issues here, and I think we should be talking about this. Uh, and I think it's important not to ignore that now, just because of the geopolitical turn. Um, the, there is, we have a lot of strong political leaders and weak institutions. We have um, certain preconditions, EU preconditions, not being fulfilled on the political um, uh, field. I mean, uh, we had uh, elections in Serbia, which were more than problematic. I'm not quite sure if the EU reacted in any way um, um, after I just gave a statement on, on the elections in Serbia. We have, um, and maybe that's done uh, here, the overview, for example, interesting, the, the rule of law in that index. Albania and Serbia are the weakest ones in that regard, and we hardly ever talk about Albanians and Albania's backsliding, <laughs> but it's happening as well. And uh, it constraints, I think that's kind of interesting because uh, you know what, has help, what is happening with check and balances, what's happening with uh, division of uh, powers, um, the constraints on government is um, the weakest in Serbia. And I mean, I just ask, myself here, should we ignore it, you know, is it now a political process, do governments decide what countries they want to have in the European Union, or should we take those kind of uh, figures into consideration as well. And about, I know EU enlargement is very much about stability and we have to, to think about stability as well with the um, uh, new association trios, they call themselves, so Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. Security is there an issue as well, as well for, for the Western Balkan countries. And uh, we talk about the stabilitocracies in the region, and it's, that's exactly it. If money goes to certain people, like Dodik, or now as well, the new government is, I think, getting as, uh, in, in North Macedonia. Sorry, I always look at you when I talk about North Macedonia without, <laughs> without exactly you representing North Macedonia. But I mean, the, you know, there is money going as well from Hungary mm -hmm. to certain parties, certain people directly, which I consider not being mm -hmm. helpful to create stability in the region. So I wonder is this narrative of the Hungarian government about creating peace and stability is actually something I should take, um, uh, you know, uh, face value. Because there is an issue and sometimes I'm not quite sure is Orban doing foreign policy or Seattle doing foreign policy or is, is kind of uh, overlapping anyhow. And then we still have, and that's for 20 years now within the countries in the Western Balkans, uh, we still have these identity issues which are not solved. Um, so the European Union, especially for the Western Balkan countries, and we can discuss uh, that now for the association tree, uh, trio, they created this additional criteria, you know, regional cooperation, you have to ensure good neighborly relation, that's in the, in the, in the progress reports all over. Um, and then, of course, the, the cooperation with the uh, International Criminal Tribunal of former Yugoslavia, which is now, you know, um, had ended, but it had moved now to the national judiciary. Uh, and reconciliation was very important. Reconciliation was kind of a precondition, which I find a bit difficult because reconciliation kind, you know, takes um, generations, and it, I think it's very difficult to make it a precondition for for EU enlargement. But still, after 20 years, it looks like the situation has not improved. I mean, um, there are conflicts, identity-based conflicts. I mean, there are the, the, the border issues, which could be normally maybe somehow negotiated. But all the identity issues which are out there, um, thanks, are more um, difficult to, um, to ne ne negotiate, and it's kind of uh, still there. And that brings me... Sorry, there's another table. Oh no, where do I have my? Oh, uh, sorry, I that that's the. <coughs> Excuse me. 
map I wanted to show. Now that brings me as well to the geopolitical situation of the new candidate countries <coughs> in the Eastern Partnership, which are not surrounded by the European Union. You see here the Western Balkans are the white um, and, um, uh, space here. Switzerland yeah, the Switzerland, <laughs> yeah. It's nice there. It's like but uh, and the UK is uh, kicked out as again, or they left, sorry. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the countries of Ukraine, Mo Moldau is actually quite lucky because it's squeezed in between Ukraine <coughs> excuse me, and Romania. Um, but I mean, what about Georgia? And then to talk about good neighborhood. <coughs> Thanks. Excuse me. Uh, what, uh, you know, and then talk about establishing good neighborhood. Um, creating regional cooperation or working on uh, regional cooperation, that starts to become very difficult. So should there be new additional criteria for that region? The European Union ignored that. They are actually implementing the criteria which they created for the Western Balkan countries. They don't talk too much about reconciliation. That was kind of in the progress reports. You don't see that, mu that much. Um, and... Um, um, but this is going to be a huge challenge of the European Union, how to deal with those co conflict issues. And I think the European Union, after 20 years of experience in the Western Balkans, doesn't have a clue how to, to address those kind of conflicts. <coughs> and my final word before I hand over, it's, uh, sorry, is we didn't talk about the capacity issue of the European Union, because that's a requirement as well for EU enlargement. Is the EU able to take all the countries in. And I mean, this is a question I think which is raising with uh, in the case of Ukraine and how, what the European Union is doing in that case. Sorry, I leave it with there and hope. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, this, this Kosovo is always making problems. Thank you, Christina. Just uh, one comment that Dimitar knows that uh, he, we Macedonia, we said Macedonia, uh, it's a Switzerland in the Balkans, but it's very dangerous theory, actually. It's not so good theory. <laughs> um, I will give the flow now to Elira Luli from the Luras University in Albania, and he asks a fellow. Yes. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I'll talk about EU's diminishing allure in the Western Balkans, so I try to trace the rising Euroscepticism in the Western Balkans. And I actually wanted to uh, follow on the logic we had uh, um, last uh, on the last panel on Monday, uh, talking about European values and uh, European norms, and how EU is losing its uh, soft power, uh, not only in the Western Balkans, but also in the international uh, arena. And um, this EU uh, power over opinion, uh, what does it mean? So according to uh, Ian Manners, uh, with the research he did in 2002, this um, EU's power over opinion is based uh, on EU's normative power. At the core of EU's normative power lie these five fundamental values, which are uh, we already articulated and uh, try to give meaning to them. So um, um, peace, liberty, democracy, rule of law, and um, uh, human rights. And after the 90s, with the rise, uh, with the uh, God forbid, with the fall of the Iron Curtains, uh, then EU started to articulate uh, four, other finer, uh, four other norms, which are um, um, uh, social solidarity, um, uh, anti-discrimination, uh, good governance, and uh, sustainable development. So uh, EU needed a set of values uh, for the future plans, future vision, um, knowing that uh, an enlargement will follow with uh, countries that were part of the communist Eastern Bloc and then the future um, uh, treaties. So this set of, set of values was really necessary for the cohesion, for the com uh, compatibility of diverse economies and diverse societies uh, within, the, uh, uh, within the European Union. So. Um, 
that's where uh, EU actually takes this power and this uh, identity in the international arena. It's all about this set of values which are entrained in EU body of laws, but also uh, in a KISS uh, communitaire. So uh, as, a, as a sender of these uh, European normative values, EU is now becoming very weak. And it has to be some sort of uh, productive dialogue between the senders, uh, the sender, EU as a sender, and the, these um, aspiring countries as receivers of this uh, normative power and being able to implement this uh, normative, uh, normative model, which is actually lacking on, uh, on both sides. And um, uh, during some, some research, preliminary research on the topic of, the day, uh, of today, I uh, found an interesting quote by Jacques Delors, and uh, I have to quote it. In Europe, you need to have the firefighter, but also the uh, architect. So you, like uh, any complex uh, political and uh, economic union, uh, faces its um, uh, emergencies and crises, and we have been experiencing it in the last decade. So starting from the Brexit and then financial crisis, uh, migration crisis and uh, pandemic, and now this ongoing war, uh, war between Russia and Ukraine. So um, it has to, to, to um, provide some swift responses uh, to avoid the uh, damages and uh, actually protect these uh, uh, societies within the European Union, but EU is becoming very crisis prone. So it's becoming very vulnerable to, uh, when it comes to this crisis, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually reacting only in times of uh, crisis. And when it comes to the um, uh, architect, uh, on the other hand, it symbolizes the long-term vision, the uh, strategic planning, the um, necessary to build and shape the future uh, of the European Union. And um, actually, right now, this political vision and uh, the strategic planning uh, is now absent in uh, the European, or, or it's weak uh, uh, within the European Union. So I wonder where these uh, architects uh, are uh, nowadays, and this is reflected also in the neighboring regions, but also uh, 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 in the Western Balkans. And I know that uh, uh, several barometers try to um, measure the support of uh, EU in uh, the states of uh, the Western Balkans. But what we miss right now is um, uh, qualitative research uh, to explore what is the breeding ground of this Euroscepticism in some countries of the Western Balkans. It might have a dual nature, we know, because uh, these countries have been really struggling to implement these normative models. So they are oscillating between autocracies and democracies, and according to international reports, they are um, uh, like they are prescribed as hybrid regimes or uh, fake democracies and so on. On the other side, EU it's um, uh, it's showing itself very weak in its observative uh, capacities, and this uh, prolonged process and it's losing its uh, credibility in some states of the Western Balkans. And uh, uh, while I was doing my research here at uh, IASC, I had to conduct some uh, interviews. And uh, the buzzword that all the interviewers centered around was Euroscepticism. So uh, that's why I thought maybe it's, uh, it's now the time to take a Euroscepticism tour and explore what is the breeding ground of this Euroscepticism in uh, Western Balkan countries. Um, uh, Albania uh, shows a good level of support when it comes to EU integration. 90% of the population uh, support uh, EU integration. They see in this process a more, uh, path to more economic progress, better living conditions, and uh, the, an opportunity to enjoy the four freedoms based on which EU uh, functions, uh, once becoming members of uh, uh, EU. But um, actually, if, if you tease them a little bit, and, I, and I'm in contact with these students all the time, uh, they actually would, um, would, would, would tell how, how uh, disappointed they are with, the, uh, with this process. And I had to conduct 
uh, research on 2000 and, uh, 2022 uh, to explore this, um, um, uh, this breeding ground of Euroscepticism, rising Euroscepticism in Albania with two university, two focus groups uh, in two university, one in Tirana and one in Duras. And I tried to ask them some uh, qualitative uh, questions. And um, uh, I, I actually try to, to ask them, are you hoping for a sooner integration in the next year? And they said no, because they are aware of the political developments uh, right now in uh, Albania, their, their level of readiness and their level of uh, preparedness. And um, I, I also asked them, uh, do, you, do you feel like Albania is in a peripheral uh, interest of the EU as uh, evinced by uh, two years of being on hold with the go-ahead to start the negotiations? And they believe that this delay is, um, as has been caused by internal uh, issues more than uh, uh, coming as a hesitation from the EU side. Another question that I asked them uh, that tells a lot about their discontent and disappointment was who is uh, more prone to put the country, the state, in the periphery of attention? So um, do you think it's about political commitment or uh, about uh, the EU? And this was a question that triggered a lot of reaction and uh, all of them uh, responded that uh, it's about political commitment and political efforts to implement this normative model, although the, there is a hesitation also from, uh, uh, from uh, the EU side. So um, one thing that you should uh, take in consideration is that Albania has not an eternal immunity when it comes to this uh, uh, support shown through these uh, surveys, although the uh, Albanian population think that there is no better opportunity than uh, EU actually. So they should be very attentive when it comes to this developing Euroscepticism. When it comes to Bosnia-Herzegovina, 68% to 70% are in favor of EU integration. So Bosnians have traditionally seen EU integration as a way to resolve all the problems of the post-war uh, uh, Bosnia, but now there is a growing uh, skepticism which relates part to the Brussels hesitation for enlargement and part to internal uh, situations. Um, they have started to perceive the integration uh, process as unfair and inconsistent, in 2014 to 2015, the support was 85%. Uh, now there is this downward trend, which is um, also apparent in uh, various public spheres, including uh, academia, intellectual spaces, and even politics. And I read an interview uh, of a professor named uh, Karcic in 2021 who said, uh, academics who once regularly lectured uh, and consulted on European integration are now reorienting their work and focusing on external uh, influences, far right and illiberal uh, politics. So, um, also non-governmental organizations that used to focus on EU membership have also moved to uh, other fields. Um, meanwhile, uh, these, these actors, these changing actors in the um, uh, social sphere like media, civil society, academia and intellectuals uh, are really powerful catalysts that historically have driven um, the, this EU integration process uh, in the country and sustained uh, the European spirit. So uh, they also are imperative for providing uh, valuable recommendations that can be instrumental in shaping uh, the EU future. So if they are somehow missing in the process, who is going to be the glue uh, in, uh, in such a process? Kosovo, um, they are the Euro enthusiasts. Uh, Kosovo enjoys 92% of support for uh, EU integration. For them, uh, EU is the most significant donor for uh, Kosovo state building and democratization uh, sorry, process. And they think that uh, EU's financial support has been uh, instrumental uh, in shaping the Kosovos that exist uh, today. Uh, uh, regarding the, the um, security, the majority of youngsters show uh, a preference for U.S. in terms of providing security in Kosovo, indicating a perception that EU uh, might not be as well prepared uh, in realm of uh, security. And uh, they believe, the youngsters especially, believe that uh, uh, EU membership will lead to uh, social economic developments 
and um, they also are aware that they will not be able or they are still unable to contend and be on par level with the developed countries within the EU, so they are also aware for the level of preparedness and readiness to join uh, the EU integration. The only discontent that uh, they have or they express is, in, uh, is on the EU mediating role between Serbia and Kosovo. So there is a prevalent uh, dissatisfaction among the youth regarding the youth's performance as a facilitator in this process. And they think that you should be more proactive uh, as the current results of the dialogue uh, process are very uh, limited. Montenegro, um, the support for EU integration in Montenegro uh, shows to be 79 to 80 uh, percent. The European integration process um, has been the most powerful engine in Montenegro for uh, the, the uh, overall change uh, over the last two decades. And in the recent period, Montenegro has intensified this course that as a front runner is ready to join the European uh, Union. Uh, the Montenegro Prime Minister Spajic, who visited Brussels in the recent months, but uh, he also, I read an interview uh, of him in the Politico, he said that we want to be part of Europe in all forms and shapes, and we want to show to the Western Balkans that Montenegro is a low-hanging fruit, so it's ready to join. Uh, it will not pose any burden to EU because of the small uh, population, and he said we can be very productive when it comes to um, bilateral, uh, to, to be a negotiator when it comes to bilateral issues and we have no, uh, we have no uh, bilateral issues with uh, neighbors in the region. But nevertheless, uh, from the EU side, the progress is needed under fundamental chapters, chapters 23, chapters 24 regarding judiciary, fundamental rights, uh, justice, freedom, and security. So uh, the, the EU integration or the, the pace of reforms will depend very much on, on this progress. North Macedonia, 68% of the respondents supports, uh, support EU integration process, but North Macedonia is now very um, disappointed when it comes to these uh, bilateral uh, issues because for two decades, North Macedonia has faced opposition from uh, two, member, uh, two member countries in the European Union. First, it was this painful agreement uh, with uh, Greece. And uh, Macedonia, after, these, uh, after reaching this agreement, awaited for some sort of reward, reward. But then it was the unexpected Bulgarian veto in 2020, which sparked a higher level of frustration and Euroscepticism. So the uh, level of trust in EU stands at an all-time low in North Macedonia, and the more the process of EU integration drags along um, and faces obstacles, especially with uh, issues of delicate nature, such as uh, cultural and national uh, questions, uh, the farther your skepticism will continue to deepen. Uh, last but not least, <laughs> Serbia. Well, Serbia is an interesting and intriguing case. 43% of population in Serbia are in favor <coughs> of EU integration. The Serbian population applies a very demanding perspective towards uh, the EU. They are um, closely monitoring the EU process within the region, uh, but also uh, with individual countries uh, within the Western Balkans. And they see actually that the region is firmly on the Union's agenda, but has never been a top item, and they perceive it really realistically. They see that the EU did not react as fast as it reacted with uh, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia two years ago at the beginning of this century when it comes to the Western Balkans. They also noted clearly in 2014 when the Juncker uh, Commission declared that no further enlargement is expected to happen but it lasted even longer. Uh, moreover, they also observed that North Macedonia was not rewar rewarded after signing this painful agreement uh, with Greece, so they, s they told why to, 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 to spend efforts with the issue of, uh, of Kosovo. For them, it's a no-go issue. And uh, when it comes to the population Excuse sentiment me. is, yes, the last one. Uh, when it comes to the population sentiment, this is shaped by uh, ac actually the, the, the past, the uh, events that uh, happened uh, in the past. 
but um, EU still remains a strategic goal, but it's not attracting anymore because they are attentive when it comes to internal standards, to these uh, uh, soaring prices, better living conditions, and uh, so on. And uh, moreover, they have these, uh, they enjoy these um, uh, other alternatives when it comes to uh, uh, partnerships. So first, uh, I think that uh, we, we need to understand, we need to, to do more research on this, uh, on this uh, rising Euroscepticism in Western Balkans because the lack of desire for EU enlargement reduces all uh, uh, domestic enthusiasm uh, for reforms. So it's a dual, actually, it's a dual problem on both sides. Um, when it comes to conclusion and recommendation, we will discuss it during uh, the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Actually, we have Dimitar here with his organization. He is researching very deeply the Euroscepticism in the Western Balkan, and probably we have discussion. Uh, because we, the time is running very fast, uh, I will give the floor to, to the Deputy Minister of Justice of the Republic of Kosovo, Vigen Ceroli. Probably he will say how do we solve the issue of Serbian <laughs> Association of the Serbian Communities. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Rubin. Um, uh, dear Professor Jody, dear Professor Ferenc, uh, Professor Attila, and uh, the others who are present here, I'm very much humbled to be back in Kosek after 15 years, as I used to spend my wonderful one year and a half here as a master's student, and it's very much honor for me. Uh, dear professors and uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to start from the last uh, uh, last uh, presentation of uh, my colleague Elira, who said that in comparison with uh, Kosovo, who is 93% uh, of the Euro-wishing Euro, uh, Euro integration in Kosovo, in Serbia is 43. So you can imagine the disbalance between the two. Uh, 75 years ago, in April 1949, two institutions were created that have transformed European history. One is NATO and the other is Council of Europe. They are the pillars of the most successful period of democratic peace in Europe. NATO uh, protects democracies through joint deterrence against external aggression. The Council of Europe protects democracy and human rights through a unique European Court of Human Rights within all or our democracies. The period since the end of the Cold War in Europe has seen our continent once again split in two. It was Western Europe that was lucky, places where citizens could sleep peacefully without worrying that a neighboring country would invade them next week, bombing their homes and expelling their population. Also places where uh, there was no fear of a dictator sending in the secret police to arrest critics late at night and threw them in a jail to be tortured. At the same time, however, there was a less fortunate, the other Europe. A part of our continent with countries whose citizens had good reason to fear repression, state torture, war and even genocide. This is the Europe of countries like Croatia in 1991, Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1992, and Ukraine today. Kosovo found itself in this situation after 1989. My nation experienced repression, massacres of civilians, arrest and torture and war. We suffered the mass deportation of more than a million people in 1999. The hopeful story of the last three decades is the massive expansion of Europe and a democratic peace. Since 1990, NATO, the EU, and the Council of Europe have more than doubled in size. Citizens in other less fortunate Europe rightly associated entering these institutions with escaping the nightmares they feared and which some continued to experience. In the next decade, we as a country and independently as a state of Republic of Kosovo, we want to join NATO. We want to join the European Union as soon as possible. But the first step we can take this year is to join the first club of European democracies created exactly 75 years ago in London, the Council of, Euro, uh, of Europe. 
Because of political pressure, Kosovo was not admitted this April in Council of Europe. It was postponed the accession, and uh, 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 this was, uh, uh, we believe, delayed in a, in a, for, for next month, probably next autumn. Uh, 75 years uh, since the creation of the Council of Europe, 25 years since NATO, Western civilizations went to war to protect and save the citizens of Kosovo from the horrors of the massacres, murders, rapes, and mass deportation. 2024 is the right year for the last democracy in Europe that is not yet a member of the international intergovernmental organizations. For this to happen, two things in addition must happen. The government of Kosovo has the full commitment to the EU to underline that we value and respect the common values of rule of law and democracy, which the organization is built. We will keep those promises and show in the, this way that we will strengthen our institutions. Our government in these three years in office has shown that the socio-economic development and democratic progress go hand in hand. They are not mutually exclusive. They condition each other positively. Uh, what has been um, recently uh, uh, happening is this so-called create, creative ambiguity of agreements and proposals between the Kosovo and Serbia under the facilitation of the European Union. Since the dialogue started between Kosovo and Serbia in 2011, around 30 agreements have been signed, some very barely implemented, some very obstructed, and some had huge ambiguities. Indeed, the entire process was treated ambiguously from the European Union itself. Ambiguously for the parties entering into it, ambiguity in the sense of the content, and ambiguous in the role of the facilitator or mediator played in the process of dialogue. The parties taking part in the dialogue do not recognize each other. This is very important. Regarding bilateral treaties, the consequence of non-recognition is a legal inability to establish formal relationship with uh, the treaty. Nonetheless, this doesn't mean that treaties cannot be concluded between two non-recognizable states. This rather implies that if the treaty is concluded in such cases, it will automatically mean implied mutual recognition. Treaties signed, in, signed under these circumstances would be valuable according to international law and would have two effects, recognition and the establishment establishment of the rights and obligations according to the treaty. In the case of the Kosovo-Serbia dispute, a comprehensive agreement ending with mutual recognition of both states is the main goal. At least this is always stated to be the final goal from the Kosovo side. But this was not the case with the EU's stances. Two agreements are worth specifically mentioning for two reasons to verify what the, uh, was said regarding bad agreements signed by Kosovo and to emphasize the EU's role, attitudes and positions related to the issue. On August 25th, 2015, Kosovo signed the agreement on the Association of Serb Majority Municipalities, which was signed while the Assembly was on the vacation. Before exploring the timing of this agreement, it's important to refer to the following citation. I'm quoting, a particular feature of the agreements between Serbia and Kosovo culminating in the 15th point 2013 of Brussels agreement was the creati creative ambiguity for not addressing the status of Kosovo. The agreement does not indicate whether Kosovo is state or not. The parties are described as sites without further details and there is no definition of how the association or community of Serb municipalities should be organized, the cornerstone of the agreement and what legal status it should have. Dozens of questions, end of quotation. Some dozens of questions could be raised regarding this agreement. It caused tension in Kosovo and continues to be the rope around its throat in the further dialogue, even though Kosovo's constitutional court ruled that the agreement conflicts with its constitution. Nonetheless, the international community pressured Kosovo pressured Kosovo to implement the agreement since they see it as an international obligation that was ratified by the co country's parliament. 
Despite being declared unconstitutional, it is still on the table and implemented via various forms of pressure. The EU's position remained ambiguous regarding its demands from Serbia as well. Officially, it does not seek Serbia's recognition from Kosovo. Uh, one of the uh, quotes made clear for, from the German government uh, says, Governments and parliaments in some EU member states, in particular Germany, made it clear that eventual EU accession would require full recognition between the two. No deep analysis is needed to see how differently the pressure is applied against Kosovo and Serbia in the process of negotiations. Serbia has always played with its dubious geopolitical orientations, directed toward the West or turned in the direction of Russia. Kosovo, on the other hand, is clearly and completely oriented toward the West, with the goal and the hope to integrate into the EU and NATO. Although parties maintain these positions, they, as stated earlier, do not face the same pressure from the EU. This type of approach was by the EU even before the war. Thus, in trading human rights, justice and democracy for a false sense of stability, or how it used to call as a stabilocracy, the EU allowed genocide to take place on its doorstep. doorstep. Then it disingenuously framed one-sided aggression as a two-sided conflict with a equal culpability. In addition, the attitude of Russia remains the same. Certainly, Russia has neither replaced the EU's influence in the Western Balkans, nor it has taken on the Union's mediating role in the Kosovo-Serbia dispute. EU membership is still associated with the economic prosperity and freedom of movement in the Balkans. Support for the Union has grown steadily between the 2016 and 2020, although Serbia is a country most concerned about the potential implication of EU accession over its national sovereignty. Kosovo still, after 16 years since declaring its independence, remains an unfinished story. This is more because of the ambiguous policies being used around it rather than of the capacities from the inside to build its, its, itself as a state. This state was created as a result of the efforts of its people with the strong support of the international community. The United States has played a crucial role. It remains in a so-called unfinished story because the international community and international politics have changed a lot since 2008. Kosovo did not enter into dialogue with Serbia as an equal. Uh, on the other hand, EU institutions have maintained a neutral stance on Kosovo uh, status and there are still five member states that do not recognize uh, 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 Kosovo's independence. Uh, in an article published by The Guardian, titled Serbia President Lauds Serbia Ties at the EU Balkan Summit, and one by the Ivana Stradner, who was very right titling her article Russia is playing with the fire in the Balkans, both point to Russian involvement in both the Balkans. Thus, an immediate request directed to the US and the EU for swift coordination and action in solving the Kosovo-Serbia dispute is, is essential. It is quite clear that without strong pressure on Serbia, there will always be obstacles to the final solution. Serbia has made it clear on many occasions and with different means that it's not going to be ready to recognize Kosovo, which is the main to key to solving the dispute between the two. And we had the case to hear former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Serbia two days ago what he said in this panel. If there is not going to be pressure, there will be always, by, always be Russian trains, issues of plates, referendums within Kosovo territory for change to the constitution of Serbia, and there will continually be activities of Serbian diplomacy to convince various states to revoke recognition of Kosovo's independence. Finally, it should be made clear to Serbia that Bosnia's cessation of Kosovo will not be allowed, which is the intermediary aim toward the partition of Kosovo where Serbia aspires to get some municipalities of the northern part of Kosovo. EU institutions should not continue to maintain neutral positions regarding Kosovo a state of independence. This neutral position full of uh, ambiguity 
in the process of facilitation and or mediation is often perceived as biased in favor of Serbia. Parties in a potential agreement should be treated equally in these processes, and this is not the case, at least uh, not formally. In addition to all ambiguities, the greatest problem in terms of Kosovo's integration, uh, a perspective remains that the five uh, EU member states, namely Cyprus, Greece, Slovakia, Spain and Romania, have not recognized Kosovo's independence. As a result, Kosovo's membership perspective remains elusive and the European Commission refers, unfortunately, only to Kosovo with the asterisk footnote containing the text agreed up, up and do, during the Belgrade-Pristina negotiations. The neutrality of the EU is hard to understand, as Professor Kushi rightfully states that this is false neutrality that has stalled the EU-led dialogue from the get-go, and this will take only grow more problematic as Kosovo government more assertive in protecting its hard-won scraps of, uh, of status. Last but not least, Russian aggression in Ukraine has intensified the efforts of the EU and US diplomacy to get the parties to reach an agreement. It has been noted many times that for the sake of foreign governments focus on stability rather than democracy and justice. This is even more noted in the circumstances of the war in Ukraine. Serbia has refused to impose sanctions against Russia whereas the EU continues to try to keep Serbia away from the Moscow. Yet the EU consistently asks Kosovo for more concessions. Examples of this include Kosovo's attempt to establish reciprocal measures regarding the license plates, Serbia threats of military action, and its demands for an association of Serbian municipalities in a time ethnic Albanians are being administratively cleansed from the entire areas of Serbia. And this happened September last year, massively when the Serbia uh, uh, organized a terrorist attack in northern part in the so-called Banska attack, when uh, still European Union refuses to go condemn this act that was condemned by the US and other uh, international uh, partners who I recognize Kosovo. Thank you very much, and I remain at your uh, availability for any questions that you might have after we finish this discussion. Thank you, Deputy Minister. And now we're going, we'll still stay in Kosovo, but uh, from the other side of the river Ibar <laughs> in Mitrovica, uh, from where actually Caleb is coming. He is from the active, but actually he is working for the, no, for the OSC mission, yeah, there in Kosovo, thank you. The floor is yours, and this is the last uh, speaker. Uh, well, thank you all very much. I'm going to try and be as brief as possible, keeping into consideration the fact that probably concentration is, is uh, on a downward trend. Um, what I would like to do is talk about uh, the north of Kosovo and the impact that the EU-led dialogue process that was touched upon in previous presentations, um, as well as the overall uh, EU integration process has had on the north of Kosovo. Um, if you live in a place like North Mitrovica, as I do, you tend to think of it as the center of the universe, but uh, uh, it actually isn't, so maybe it would be good uh, for me to begin just by giving a little bit of background information. Uh, about the north of Kosovo, it's made up of four uh, municipalities, all of which have a large uh, Kosovo Serb uh, majority. Um, it has been uh, in the past uh, a flashpoint for uh, conflict um, due to its very specific sort of uh, geopolitical position and its uh, social political uh, dynamics. Um, one of the reasons why it's such a sort of, uh, let's say, strange area is that for the past 20 or so years, at least since the secession of hostilities in the late 1990s, it has very much existed in a kind of uh, political and institutional uh, vacuum. Uh, there were very few uh, functioning governmental institutions, the ones that were there. 
uh, operated under the legal and budgetary framework of uh, the government of Serbia. Um, so this integration process that began with the sign of, signing of the Brussels Agreement in uh, 2013 and that was facilitated by the European Union was very much for people uh, in that area a sort of shock to the system. Um, because we are talking about a place where ultimately and at the end of the day uh, people had very uh, little interaction with any kind of institutional structures. Um, you might describe it as lawless, uh, although for me personally that would, be, uh, that would be a bit of an exaggeration, but certainly if we're talking about something like the rule of law, uh, it was very weak, as was any kind of uh, institutional presence. Uh, so when the EU came in uh, and facilitated the signing of the Brussels Agreement uh, as well as a series of um, talks between Belgrade and Pristina, uh, what, we, what we found or, or what we have is essentially a very top-heavy process. Uh, top-heavy process in the sense that uh, it's a process that's very much centered uh, around Belgrade and Pristina and we have a situation where local communities in the north of Kosovo are locked out uh, of these processes. Uh, I think some people in uh, Marton uh, perhaps touch on this is that it's uh, a question of credibility. What credibility does the EU have uh, to lead this process and uh, how uh, successful have they been uh, thus far in achieving the degree of uh, institutional integration, integration in the north as well as the achievement of a degree of uh, rule of law uh, in that area. Uh, something else that's interesting is uh, the extent to which uh, the EU-led dialogue process and the integration process, EU integration process, excuse me, uh, have affected inter-ethnic relations. Uh, in that region. Uh, we have, of course, still today a high degree of uh, ethnic uh, fragmentation and I think that there was a certain amount of expectation that the idea of a shared European future uh, and EU integration could bring the Kosovo Serb and uh, the Kosovo Albanians together at least to a certain extent. Um, we're not necessarily here talking about a process of uh, reconciliation but rather one perhaps of cohabitation. Uh, cohabitation uh, uh, around a set of, let's say, uh, common and shared interests. Uh, that there is this common interest that Kosovo Serbs and Kosovo Albanians have to take on this European path and to work together uh, towards uh, European integration. Uh, the question now is, uh, is that happening? Um, the situation since uh, the signing of the Brussels Agreement in 2013, if we're talking about the inter-ethnic uh, inter relations in Mitrovica in particular, has changed quite radically, but at the same time there's still, uh, there's still a long way to go. What we don't have, uh, we have a very distinct lack of uh, inter-ethnic communication. Uh, Mitrovica as a city is of course divided uh, into two municipalities. Um, and so the, the, the level of contact between those two communities outside uh, of a, let's say, economic context uh, is very low. Um, another issue is, and I think I touched on this earlier, is that uh, there is this sort of dissidence between uh, Kosovo Serbs and Kosovo Albanians in, in terms of how they perceive uh, the European Union. In recent public opinion among Kosovo Serbs, uh, both in the north as well as south of the river Ibar, only about 15 of them uh, believe that the European Union is acting in the interest of uh, the Kosovo Serb community, and we still have very high levels of Kosovo Serbs who uh, expressed a greater level of trust, for example, in the Russian Federation or in China to defend Serb interests in Kosovo uh, as opposed to the e United States or um, the European Union. Uh, whereas, of course, as has been mentioned before, uh, the level of support for, the, for EU integration um, among Kosovo Albanians uh, is much higher. However, this is not necessarily indicative uh, of uh, trust in the EU to lead uh, the dialogue process effectively. Uh, what we've seen over the past couple of months and indeed over the past couple of years, uh, particularly since 2022, is uh, 
very severe, is a very severe stagnation uh, in the dialogue process, which has had a negative trickle-down effect to uh, interethnic, uh, the interethnic relationship uh, at the ground level. Um, at the moment, uh, it could be argued that if we're talking about uh, uh, the potential for reconciliation or co cohabitation, it hasn't been as, ba as bad as it is now for a very long time. Um, the, the, it could be perhaps argued that the danger of armed conflict uh, has uh, receded, at least for the moment, but uh, the tension is still very much there and the lack of trust uh, is still very much there. Um, one of the reasons for this is, is that uh, we have a number of, of processes that are going on that are very uh, opaque to people. Uh, what is uh, uh, EU integration? What does that mean exactly? Uh, what agreements uh, have been signed? Uh, what is the Ohrid agreement? I mean, these are questions that I might know and people in this panel not might know uh, the answer to, but people in, this, in North Kosovo certainly do not. Um, and of course, these are developments and these are uh, political changes that have had a very, very uh, direct and very severe uh, impact on people's daily lives. Uh, the integration process of the North into uh, Kosovo's uh, legal and institutional structures has been, uh, in a sense, traumatic. And I think that trauma has been compounded by the fact that communication between uh, centers of political power like Belgrade and Pristina and the European Union and the local population is very poor. Uh, the Ohrid agreement uh, wasn't actually signed uh, by Serbia. Uh, both sides uh, are pointing the finger at uh, the other that they haven't been uh, implemented the, implementing the agreement uh, uh, as uh, they're supposed to, but the opaqueness and the ambiguity of the entire situation has, uh, I think, led to a deterioration in how people view uh, the European Union and people's willingness to uh, engage and support uh, the process of uh, EU integration. Um, the idea of constructive ambiguity uh, has been touched on on a number of occasions during this panel discussion. Constructive ambiguity was designed to foster dialogue, actually. Uh, the initial goal was to, okay, we're going to design these agreements, but we're going to purposefully uh, make them uh, vague and open to interpretation, and by doing that, we're going to encourage uh, uh, more discussion and dialogue between Belgrade and Prishina, the, the, the effect has actually been quite the opposite because you have the association of uh, Serb majority municipalities uh, that has not uh, been formed. Talks around that have uh, stalled, as usual with Prishina saying one thing, Belgrade saying, uh, uh, saying another. Um, so the question is, uh, where do we go? Where do we go from here? Uh, where does the EU go from here? Uh, because essentially, the situation, uh, particularly in the north of Kosovo, uh, has been arguably uh, uh, worsened by this ambiguity and by this inherent lack uh, of clarity in uh, in the dialogue process. Um, also, I see my time is running out. My promise to be brief uh, was not quite uh, honest, but uh, um, what, I, wh what I would like to point to is that uh, uh, there's a lot of talk in Kosovo, particularly in the north, of reconciliation. But this is another thing that's very opaque to peop people, because what does reconciliation actually mean? Uh, it's a very uh, broad concept, one that's very difficult to pr uh, uh, pin down, and you have Kosovo Albanians who have one conception of reconciliation, and Kosovo Serbs uh, that have another conception of reconciliation. Uh, however, what is interesting, despite uh, uh, reservations, particularly on the part of Kosovo Serbs, about the EU's role in all of these processes, uh, both communities have shown some kind of willingness to engage in direct dialogue. And it's this kind of dialogue that actually has the most uh, support among, uh, among both uh, communities. Uh, so I think what would be good to see uh, uh, in the near future is for both the EU as well as other international stakeholders that are present in Kosovo, present in Kosovo to uh, 
take more, uh, take into more careful consideration uh, the views and needs of these communities that are ultimately uh, the ones that are going to be impacted the most uh, by the dialogue process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you to all the panelists for this uh, very, for me, constructive and fruitful, actually, panel discussion. Now it's um, fifth quarter to 12, so let's take maybe 20 minutes. Uh, it's okay, 20 minutes? Okay. Uh, but 20 minutes, I think it will be a very small time. Short time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So let's make one um, management of the time. Uh, uh, please first register who want to take the floor for comments and questions. Okay, okay. I am moderating. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We saw how Kosovo and Serbia solve the problem, so let me. <laughs> okay, yes. And uh, maybe from online, if you have something, please raise your hands online. Uh, and uh, sorry, um, please, uh, up to three minutes, comment and questions. And then, then we will give the floor to get to the panelists to answer to your questions and, and conclusions. So it will not be. Because dialogue or uh, uh, dual conversation would be, let's just say, one context conversation, maybe comments, question, and then they will, they will collect the questions for two, four, five, I don't know, people. First, uh, it's Nella, then the, the lady from Holland, yeah, then Dimitar, Ferenc, you are asking us, or you are in there? And then, please, Nella. I will write now again. Thank you very much. My name is Nelly Kirilova from the European Security and Defense College in Brussels, doctoral school on CSDP CFSP, and I'll comment and ask questions the three panelists on this side. So first we heard that the uh, EU is um, al already for 20 years uh, in a pending status uh, regarding the accession of the Western Balkan countries. Then we heard that the institutionalism of the Western Balkan countries is not good enough and they are not fulfilling the criteria. And then we heard that the civil society in the Western Balkan countries is losing uh, their trust and interest uh, in a different speed, but a little by little that they could be accessed in the EU. In this case, I would say that uh, after staying some time in Brussels and in this environment, I uh, have noticed that the interpretation or misinterpretation between what the different uh, countries and cultures have in mind related to the Brussels bubble and the uh, Western Balkan countries is a big issue. In this case, uh, the Western Balkan countries, as we heard on Monday in the first uh, panels, are expecting that there is a top-down approach from the leading actor, being it uh, Brussels in this case, the European Union, but uh, because earlier it was um, managed in this way in Yugoslavia and the post-Soviet and Soviet uh, era. And uh, at the current moment, maybe the way that the Western Balkan countries are expecting the interaction from the European Union is a top-down approach. At the same time, in Brussels, the expectation is that the approach comes from the civil society and from the local governments and institutions, and that they will be uh, willing and implementing the decisions and changes by themselves. But this is not happening because both sides expect the opposite uh, approach, either top-down or bottom-up, from the other side. So how do you think that we could manage with this misinterpretation? Thank you very much. Dutchy. Yes, yes, the Dutchy. <laughs> um, but maybe good to know for the other people. I'm sorry? Yeah, I'm from the Netherlands. I'm 90% entrepreneur and 10% academic. So, uh, so maybe I look from a different perspective and I totally understand in the beginning the skepticism towards the European Union and everything what happens from your experience. Um, what, what I would be interested in is to know how you cooperate as West Balkan countries, because together you have the size exactly of the Netherlands. So I think together maybe to unite, so are there joint actions? I understand you have your country, you want to be part of the European Union, you do that, and there's a, a bit of a one-way street. But 
are there any ways of cooperating to make your voice a bigger voice towards the European Union? Because together you're the Netherlands, so yeah, so maybe I, I was just wondering what kind of cooperations you have. Yeah, thank you, Dimitar Nikolovsky from Eurotink from North Macedonia. Um, well, me, I come from an NGO that has Europe twice in the name, and we are very strongly pro-European uh, organization. But what we have faced in the past few years is that we are not taken seriously much by by our uh, by other stakeholders or by the citizens of uh, our country. And I would have to say that the reason for this is uh, this feeling of hopelessness that we see in not perhaps in every country of the Western Balkans, but in many of those. And I would say that this is one of the m perhaps main sources of this uh, Euroscepticism. Uh, that simply when we measure public opinion, and we have been doing this since 2014, uh, up until maybe four years ago, we could see a lot of hope in terms of how many years it would take for us to become uh, European members. And now uh, this hope is uh, dimin diminishing to the point of saying never. And then in our uh, qualitative research, when we ask people, okay, so what do you think we should achieve? What do you think that we should do? So they would say, at least some associative uh, relationship with, uh, with the European Union. So you see that there is a rising e Euroscepticism, but still the European Union is the most desired alternative. And for North Macedonia, the ratio between EU as the most desired alternative and something as uh, BRICS or Eurasia is two uh, to one. So still, you know, there is uh, still hope, uh, uh, hope in this uh, regard. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. My name is Krzysztof Puszka and I'm from Biboist One College for Advanced Studies. Uh, I just wanted to ask two like, very brief questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, what is your opinion on the enlargement? Like, how will it change the dynamics in the European decision making? Be because it will also have a very big impact, uh, I think. And could uh, Central and Eastern European countries and also the Balkan countries uh, cooperate in a way to balance the power of the Western European countries. And the second question is, um, we can see already that the European Union needs um, an institutional reform. Uh, and what is your opinion? Which should the European Committee go with at first uh, the enlargement and then with uh, a bigger community, uh, much more, um, I don't know, uh, uh <laughs> sorry. Uh, so yeah, that's just a deep the brief question. Which should we go at first, the enlargement or the, uh, the reform process? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I just have a short question. Uh, yeah, uh, Igor Stipic, uh, PhD student from uh, University of Regensburg. So uh, I just would like to maybe ask a short question. Uh, when we speak about this Euroscepticism, like because you're talking about really a large sample of population, I'm not so sure about whom are you talking about. Uh, so maybe if you could tell us if there is some kind of uh, you know, like specific uh, social groups that are more likely to be Eurosceptics in these countries uh, that you are considering, if you have any kind of knowledge uh, of this. Uh, I would be interested to uh, yeah, hear a bit more about this. You know, that was a, <coughs> there was a, a stunning joke in the beginning of the 90s that um, old man goes fishing and, 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 and catches a, a golden fish. Golden fish said, listen, old man, um, if you put me back to the lake, you can wish, you have three, three wishes. Okay, I want to be young, I want to be rich, and I want to be very influential. So it happens, the fish goes back to the lake, <coughs> the gold man, the old man wakes up in a beautiful castle, even more or palace, even more beautiful than the, the first stage, and the sun shines in, and um, 
He looks in the mirror. He says, a very good-looking young man. The door opens. A beautiful lady comes and said, <coughs> hurry up, Ferdinand. We have to go to Sarajevo. <laughs> that is, that I thought that I, I told this joke uh, between 91 and 90, maybe several hundred times. And then I said, let's forget it. It's just an pastime. It's not. And this, that, that we have to see that there are unsolvable problems if you remain in your box. This problem between it and hatred and mutual accusation between two small, uh, a bigger one and a smaller one, ethnic group, or you can call nation, is unsolvable if you remain in this, this box and the European Union would never solve it. Yeah? They m might believe that they help you with this and that and, and <clears throat> maybe NGOs, and, um, but it's completely true what, what Jocelyn asked. If you should think, we should think about third ways, how to jump out from this box, how to make your voice be heard more clearly, and how to restart another dialogue about the future of Europe. I completely agree with all of you, were wonderful presentations, and, and yeah, we, we were talking about it. We began <laughs> 15 years ago already, and um, I think it was a wonderful example what um, Ahmed Evin and Attila Aralp um, started, I don't know when was it exactly, 2001, or the, the EU-Turkey Observatory. Just about that. About that, yeah, it went upon until Angela Merkel and Tony Blair discovered that this is the end of multicultural, multiculturalism and Turkey, Turkey should wait. Um, I'm, I'm over-exaggerating, we can go back to this, but there was a significant moment when this has, didn't have any more visibility, but I think it's a mistake. We should, okay. But because of Ankara, not because of Ankara. I, Com not completely agree with you, but that's a long debate we can continue after <coughs> uh, the, the panel. I think it always has both sides. And that is that is the, the binary logic should be formed. We cannot go further. Even John von Neumann understood the problem of his genius invention. The binary logic uh, has a lot of hidden errors. We need to think in a more complex terms. And that's a very, very complex situation. And now it seems that everyone <laughs> is moving towards Sarajevo. Yeah? That's a very, very dire situation. So that is my, we had a very good discussion after the Sunday reception with, <coughs> with, with a very good group of people from that region. Almost everyone was represented in Bulgaria, Albania, etc. And stay in touch. Yeah, good. Um, and one of my suggestions was that maybe we should start, and the this Europe House is probably a good platform for it, um, a new dialogue, a new thinking, whatever we can call it, a Balkan EU Observatory or whatever we want to call it. But um, this is really nonsensical that you have a lot of very, very clear and, and legitimate claims and there is no real discourse and dialogue about it, neither on political level, on, on, on historical level, on, on so social scientific level, that, that can be changed. And it's not a very, you, if you don't touch the issue directly upon and you don't just push your demands and accusations of the other side and you get around, you talk, do, 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 do talk about the circumstances, the complexities, you might or we might arrange something. So uh, this is my, um, I know there's no immediate answer, but let, let us think about it. Yeah, so, okay, and um, yeah, well, this is a complex issue and you cannot solve complex issues with simple means, that is, and simple answers. Thank you. Thank you, Ferenc. <laughs> uh, now, um, yeah, we have one question from Anelia, or she is also an IS fellow from Sofia, and uh, Professor Gessler already wrote, and she will answer it. Uh, I will give uh, actually now the, um, the floor to the panelists, uh, up to three minutes, to, to answer the questions and to conclude, okay? And um, I will just now pass the microphone to Vedran, and we will finish it with Carl Lepo, okay? 
Th thank you so much for all the inputs and thank you for, for the questions. Obviously, there is no time to answer the questions. Uh, but there will, be more time this afternoon. <laughs> there will be more time this afternoon. There will be more time uh, during the lunch. Uh, you know, the, the, the most important moments at the conferences are the lunches and the breaks. This is where the real discussion happens. Um, and the evening parties, uh, uh, in, in the case that there is some alcohol. Uh, no, uh, because Ferenc just started off with, with jokes and, and I don't think that, I mean, it would take a lot of time to, to answer all the questions that you, that you posed, but let's just try to circumvent them with, with a joke that usually Ivan Krastev tells, and he's the best joke teller. I mean, he's Bulgarian, he's competing with Bosnians. I mean, Bosnians and Bulgarians, in order to survive, they just need to tell jokes all the time, because this is the only way to cope with reality. Uh, but anyway, Ivan Krastev had uh, used to have this joke uh, uh, previously about optimists and pessimists about the EU enlargement, and you probably know it all. So the, I don't know, the optimists are those that believe that uh, Turkey is going to join during the Albanian uh, Council Presidency, and the pessimists those that believe that Albania is going to join during the Turkish uh, EU's Presidency. And now you see what happens uh, with, with the enlargement. I mean, enlargement has become a thing that even obscures uh, uh, this division between optimism and pessimism. So now comes comes uh, an additional joke on top of it. Now you have Ukraine and Moldova in it. So now the question will be, is the optimist someone who believes that Ukraine is going to join during the Bosnian presidency of the EU Council, uh, or the pessimist the one that believes that Bosnia is going to join during the Ukrainian presidency of the European Union Council? So basically, uh, it, 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 it just tries to capture uh, the difficulty of the moment that we have uh, and the, the, the specificity, uh, specific peculiarity of the, of the developments right now that are, uh, uh, in, at least in the case of the Western Balkans, not, not leading to the best results. So, uh, uh, to conclude and to pick up on, on and to end on a positive note, uh, 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 Nikola Nic just mentioned, uh, uh, Dimitri mentioned the hope. Uh, I mean, and we always circle around this notion of hope. So there is a hope, there is no hope, and if there is no hope, we need new hope, and then we just go in circles with this hope and time passes by. And I think uh, what we certainly need, and that follows up on, 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 on what several of you mentioned, but also friends, with the need for new dialogue and opening up and asking tough questions, I think we don't need hope, but we, de we do need practices of hope. Practices of hope means real actions in real time. It means opening up, and it certainly includes uh, when it comes to, to the question of enlargement, but also the future of the European Union, it includes uh, the task uh, to think the Union differently bottom-up. Uh, 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 bottom-up means looking at the islands uh, of uh, European Union liberal uh, universalist energies of, of activism, etc., etc. I think there are a lot of those islands also in the Western Balkans, I mean, right now around the environmental movements, etc., etc. So I think practices of hope, opening up new lines and new lines of dialogue. Okay, I have three minutes. Okay, <laughs> thanks. So I'm not quite sure if the, um, uh, the ladies are still there asking the questions. Or, oh, sorry, yes, okay. Um, yeah, about the top-down approach or, you know, that um, how to proceed with the EU enlargement process and the, the Western Balkan countries waiting for a more top-down approach. Um, um, yes, I mean, uh, in the end, the EU enlargement process is a policy of the European Union. It's a strategy by the European Union and the countries of the Western Balkans do want to join the European Union. So it is actually something the European Union has to tell and quite clearly with you know benchmarks what has to be done and the countries can decide if they want to do it or not i mean in the end um, and i understand that the european union as well started to work with the civil society more because they were hoping that they can find a way around the political leaders they had difficulties with because they didn't uh, implement the report um, the, the reforms which were required so therefore kind of it's a doubled approach you know, you have to work with political leaders, but as well working with civil society to get the society moving and uh, to create this kind of democratization from the bottom up. But true, it is true that the European Union as well do not speak with one voice because they're not able to do that because, I mean, they can, you know, issue a, a, a strategic approach or a paper, 
But then when it comes to the decision-making time, a EU member still can say we're not going to go for it. So the majority voting is, I think, has to be uh, reviewed. There was the, the question about um, why the countries of the Western Balkans do not work with more closely with each other together to achieve the, the aim. And I think the identity issues are still in the way. So because for a long time, or there was a while ago, Croatia wants a member or uh, offered support to Serbia. But that's I think, is, is gone because all these identity issues are still around and there is kind of the bilateral relations among the neighboring countries are kind of political level, I assume, but you know, might be corrected, <laughs> um, yeah, is not uh, in, uh, improving. And then there was the issue of the, as well, the Berlin process. Uh, the Berlin process celebrated its 10th year, uh, again, in Berlin. Um, I think what happened is, I mean, for a while it was um, uh, rotating around other countries, and I think countries were really engaged. Not all of the EU member countries were involved in the process, so there was the dynamic much better because it was pro-European countries. I mean, among them the UK, which kind of dropped out at the day when when they actually um, held the summit, but uh, or kind of uh, they, they hold the summit, but then the, the, the foreign minister resigned at the same day, something like that. But then I think I lost track of what's going on with the, the, the Balkan process. Maybe because there is ongoing work which is not fancy enough to be reported constantly because it's more tedious work. Uh, or maybe not, 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 not that much is happening. But still, the uh, German government is very much pushing to keep the Berlin process going. Um, and I think they are kind of now making sure that it's kind of staying there. But I'm not sure how much engaged the other countries, other e EU countries are in, in the process and what's really going on. But for a while it went quite well, but it was the, uh, the connectivity agendas. It was kind of functional issues which were putting at the forefront of the Berlin process. And uh, maybe uh, that was not enough. Exactly. And then, sorry, my last comment, because you mentioned, you know, countries uh, joining the European Union and then coming together to cooperate against the Western dominance. The, the issue, I fully understand where you're coming from and understand that notion, but if you start to ask those kind of questions within the European Union, then the European Union is doomed. Because actually we should think about cooperating and addressing political issues, not rather cooperating to address each other or having um, a conflict with each other in the European Union. And, but I know real politics tells us something different. So I, I know why you ask the questions, but it's, I'm not happy with it. <laughs> but uh, it's a legitimate, legitimate question. Thanks. Thank you. Just, um, yeah, yeah. Just uh, to Huma, please write the question. We don't uh, give you the floor. Yeah. Ah, OK. Thank sorry. You. OK. Well, um, well, where to start from? Um, changing agents. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Yes, yes, yes. Well, changing agents at the social sphere are very important. Uh, civil society, media, intellectuals, academia. And actually, they are the glue into this process. So uh, when, it, when, when I think of Western Balkan countries and their path towards EU integration, this has been more a... Um, top-down uh, uh, approach and uh, the, the EU has been very much relying on these uh, political class to, to solve all the problems and somehow um, avoiding or maybe not uh, uh, putting a lot of attention to these uh, social agents. And uh, EU is also lacking in uh, effective communication. So it might not be an effective communication per se, because I think EU has all the necessary capacities as, and is well organized when it comes to effective communication. But maybe it is because it not being ready, not having these absorptive capacities, it is trying to keep it low, uh, like let's keep it low, let's keep it decent and we see what we'll do. Because if we talk too much about this EU integration and this is not approaching, this is not coming, then people will become more disappointed and more uh, disengaged. So I, I think there is uh, a huge problem when it comes to this uh, effective communication uh, on the EU side. And uh, I think that Western Balkan countries are perceiving uh, EU also as an economic actors, uh, an economic actor, like uh, 
uh, not wanting to hear, not wanting to hear about these values and these norms. And uh, when it comes to um, implementing this normative uh, model and implementing reforms, they are somehow uh, not not very much willing. But they expect uh, economic benefits when it comes uh, uh, to the EU role, and um, these. Uh, uh, eager questions about Euroscepticism, well, uh, I will talk about the case of Albania because uh, I am always in contact with students and I try to, to, to know uh, more about their, their feelings and their sentiments and how they perceive this, uh, this uh, process. Well, they are concerned and they are disappoint disappointed that it will take a long term. It will take a long term because they see the internal develop developments when it comes to uh, economic progress, political issues, and so on. The opposition right now in Albania is completely shattered, so there is no hope for a, a better political alternative. So all these problems uh, actually cause a lot of uh, uh, reactions when it comes to, to, the, to the youth and uh, to, to, to the public perceptions. And the brain drain is also a pressing issue uh, in Albania. And I think Albania and North Macedonia have the highest rates of uh, brain drain. And that is a strong indication of Euroscepticism, uh, uh, evolving Euroscepticism. And human capital is actually very important imperative for this uh, small populations and small size economies uh, in Western Balkans. Uh, not only for uh, sustainable development, but also for a sort of reaction, for, for sort of uh, uh, like who is going to, to, to ask for accountability and responsibility towards these uh, political figures that we have in power, who actually expect to have uh, 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 like um, um, like EU to lose its credibility in the Western Balkans so that they can uh, accommodate better in their uh, position and amplify their power and they say yeah we this EU, EU integration is in our agenda it's our um, strategic goal but at the same time they use it for course evading so this is more or less the, the situation thank you you have another question but maybe you will answer it uh, I have only one small intervention regarding whether the EU should be reformed or enlarged. So this is a, a very um, affirmative question and this is as European Union uh, is big uh, itself in the terms of Margaret Thatcher, a former British Prim pr uh, Prime Minister who said a long time ago that yesterday's solution to tomorrow problems and the European Union is becoming such an uh, organized institution in, uh, in the sense that uh, differences between the France and Germany are, are very high. Uh, Germany uh, believes that the accession of the rema six remaining uh, Western Balkan countries is the finality of the uh, whole European idea of whole European Union and the whole idea of European integration while while uh, French state is, uh, is uh, concurring in this sense. So between France and Germany, of course, I, I, uh, I vote and I applaud uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, uh, who was instrumental and in the Berlin process previously, Madame, uh, former, I mean, not himself Scholz, but a German, German state. And that now, currently, German, sorry, German, uh, German Chancellor, uh, when I see the dialogue between Pristina and Belgrade, Germany is firmly believing that the mutual recognition uh, between the, as the United States previously, um, have said that uh, a mutual recognition should be in the center of the final, of the uh, final uh, legally binding agreement. So, uh, until Germany and France uh, do not agree uh, whether uh, uh, Western Balkans countries should be uh, accepted to the European Union, I believe we can just theoretically observe here. Thank you. Thank you. A few points. Uh, first, I very much like the comment about how the EU is undermining democratic processes in getting the results in changing the uh, legal systems of all these countries, because we often overlook the fact that disguised in legal speak, uh, serious and far-reaching political changes are taking place. 
And um, it was also equally interesting to see that how the fears about EU skepticism within the EU and EU skepticism without, outside of the EU have been emerging. And we keep asking the question that what has gone wrong with the people? It must be Russian disinformation or something, but maybe the, maybe the problem is not with the people, but with some th something else, which is a little less convenient to look at. So maybe we could also uh, go into that direction a little bit. Um, I very much like also the uh, discussion on uh, whether deepening or enlargement should come first. I think this is a lame excuse not to do anything in the European Union because you can always point on something that we're not doing because what if we open up the treaties and, and how we're going to end up if that happens and so on and so forth. And alluding to what um, Ferenc said about uh, the, the problems with the binary solutions, uh, they came up again. Uh, on one of the slides we saw that f Serbia is so frustrated with uh, the EU accession process that they're going to turn to Russia. But other times it's China, then it's Saudi Arabia, then it's Turkey, and so on and so forth. So even in these very simple cases, the binary solutions do not work. So maybe we should also enlarge our horizons a little bit to see that this is far from being uh, a binary puzzle at the end of the day. Uh, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I don't quite remember all of the questions exactly, but I would, I do think it would be interesting to touch on two things. One is the question that was posed uh, uh, in this chat, and the other uh, groups within society uh, that are Eurosceptic. I mean, I think if we look at a country like Serbia, uh, I think there are parallels, for example, with North Macedonia, where you see a growing level of desperation uh, among the general population when it comes to the current political and uh, economic uh, situation in the country. You also have conflicting uh, messages from uh, leadership. Uh, Vucic on one hand uh, ostensibly supports uh, Serbia's European path, but at the same time he uh, quite often employs uh, anti-EU or, or uh, anti generally uh, anti-Western rhetoric. Uh, so I think that's confusing. Uh, so th there's a very distinct lack of clarity uh, about which direction uh, the country is uh, headed in when it comes to its relationship with the EU uh, and European uh, integration in general. Um, about the mini Schengen uh, and whether or not it will help uh, enter the EU, uh, I, I think that's part of the idea that uh, the EU doesn't, uh, at least uh, formally, it doesn't want to subsume pre-existing conflicts. So if uh, countries in the region can demonstrate that they are able to cooperate by forming a, uh, forming a, a mini Schengen zone, then uh, I think in theory that could, uh, that could uh, help to facilitate or foster uh, uh, EU membership eventually. Um, although I don't think it's a golden ticket to the European Union either. Um, as for its potential to overcome economic crises, um, uh, from what I understand, uh, the lifting of trade barriers between countries in the region has the potential to facilitate economic development. Uh, I'm not an economist, so it's not something that uh, I can necessarily go into in any kind of uh, detail, uh, but surely there's something to their arguments that the removal of borders uh, in general in the region would uh, not just facilitate economic development, but would also uh, bring uh, countries in the area closer together. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to first the panelists, also for your contribution. Very fruitful question. I don't know that we answered the, the question of the of the panel. Is there a chance for a new East-West dialogue? <laughs> Probably, I think that always a dialogue have to be <laughs> established and to be promoted. Maybe it's not East-West. Maybe it's North-South uh, dialogue, <laughs> but uh, in Europe, I, I think. But however, I think that uh, we have a very good. Um, Contributions, comment, thesis, and uh, for all these uh, PhD candidate and master candidate and uh, all who are making research, uh, this will be very fruitful for your future researching. Also, I want to pay attention. Uh, Gabi will share you the questionnaire that we are uh, making, uh, uh, and please fulfill uh, these two or three days before we end the, the questionnaire. Uh, by email, uh, it was just 10 minutes. It would be also help to us to make um, 
uh, better uh, conclusions. Thank you very much.